All right, I think this is on. Uh, and uh, welcome everybody to uh, this new chat. I'm here. Uh, my name is Macon Phillips. Uh, my handle is uh, at Macon44, and I'm joined with Jay Carney, whose handle is uh, at PressSec. Jay, thanks for doing this. This is uh, something new. Uh, we're just going to try for a few minutes here. We've got the live camera on here at the White House. A bunch of questions already coming in on the uh, hashtag Pound1Q, which stands for first question. And we're going to dive right into it and try to get a uh, a few uh, answers out, um, and if this works, maybe do this again uh, sometime. So uh, as you're watching, uh, you can uh, uh, share the link for, uh, for this at whitehouse.gov slash live, and then just join the conversation at uh, uh, hashtag uh, 1Q, uh, first question. So uh, thanks everyone for joining. So Jay, let's just uh, kick this off with the obvious question. Is first question uh, all a ploy just to get more followers? Yes, Okay. absolutely. <laughs> the, uh, uh, the fact is that uh, the, my handle at PressSec does have a lot of uh, followers. I, I'm, I'm grateful for that. But, but you know, part of my job is to try to communicate uh, what the president's doing, what he's thinking, to as many people as possible. And uh, the briefing is a tried and true institution uh, where I interact and take questions with and take questions from the uh, White House press corps. Uh, but there are a lot of other ways uh, to reach people, and, and uh, this is a, uh, a, great, a great avenue to do that. All right. Well, uh, just as soon as we posted this, we, uh, we got a response from uh, our friends uh, over in the Senate uh, in the Republican uh, uh, part of the Budget uh, uh, Committee who asked, does the White House have any comment on the vote today on the President's budget? Will it be embarrassing if it goes down 0 to 97 again? So what's your comment on that? Well, sure. I'd, I'd love to talk about that. This is uh, another gimmicky effort by Republicans uh, in Congress. It's regrettable uh, because Everyone who has studied the issue uh, of the challenges that we face uh, as a country, our budget challenges, our uh, medium and long-term fiscal challenges, knows that there is one uh, solution, which is to take a balanced approach to uh, uh, deal with our deficit and debt problems by uh, cutting non-defense discretionary spending, which the President has done. He has already uh, signed into law. Uh, reductions in non-defense discretionary spending. That's all the, the spending that uh, isn't linked to uh, formulas like Medicare and Social Security uh, and is not defense spending. So every domestic program. Uh, he's reduced that to a level uh, of GDP that is lower than under any president since Dwight Eisenhower. That is a fact. It is an irrefutable fact. Uh, the other element that has to be included is entitlement reform. The president in his own budget proposal has put forward some uh, uh, very progressive reforms to entitlements that will strengthen uh, Medicare, for example, and Medicaid. The third element has to be uh, increased revenues. Uh, the fact is, uh, for the 10 years prior to President Obama taking office, the middle class was being tremendously squeezed, even before the Great Recession, uh, while the wealthiest Americans were seeing uh, their incomes increase dramatically. Um, we have uh, relatively low tax rates, some of the lowest income tax rates than we've, uh, that we've had in 50-odd years. The president believes that everybody should uh, get a fair shot, get a fair shake, and play by the same uh, set of rules, and that they should do their fair share. And that includes uh, uh, asking the wealthiest to uh, uh, contribute a little bit more. Okay. Uh, our next question comes in uh, from Ethan Manuel, who asks, Will the president block Shell's plans to drill for oil offshore in the Arctic, uh, Chukchi and Beaufort Seas, uh, uh, ocean this summer? Well, I, I'll have to uh, be honest with you that I don't have a specific response to that question. What I can tell you is that the president is committed, uh, as a general principle, to expanding our domestic oil and gas production, uh, but doing it in a safe and responsible way. Uh, he believes that that is achievable. And the last three and a half years, the three and a half years that he's been president, uh, prove uh, that he's right. Uh, domestic oil and gas production are all uh, are, uh, is up uh, under this president, uh, and uh, and that's in spite of the fact that we obviously had a, ter a terrible uh, oil spill in the Gulf, uh, and as a result of that, uh, the president ensured that we instituted uh, a, a new standards that would uh, make sure that producers there, people, uh, companies that would drill there, had the capacity to. Uh, deal with a spill the size of uh, the, uh, the Blue Horizon spill that we saw a couple of years ago, uh, and now we're back to leasing again. Uh, he believes that we can expand domestic oil and gas production in a safe and responsible way, uh, and it's part of his all-of-the-above energy uh, approach, which he believes is the only way we can deal with our uh, long-term energy security needs uh, so that we become less dependent uh, on foreign sources of energy. 
Uh, <clears throat> that's a position that's in stark contrast, uh, unfortunately, uh, to Republicans who don't share his vision for uh, investing in clean energy and renewables. Uh, we've already seen the amount of uh, energy produced in this country through uh, clean energy te technology, renewable technology, uh, double under his uh, presidency, uh, and uh, further investments in that area is essential, not just because it will increase our uh, rely, increase our independence, our energy independence, but because those industries will create good jobs and we need those jobs here in the United States of America. All right. Um, another one comes, well actually before I do the next, let me just sort of remind people, that those of you just hearing about this, um, that we're answering questions that we're seeing at the pound one Q hashtag, uh, that stands for first question. We've got uh, Jay Carney at PressSec here, uh, I'm Macon Phillips. Uh, at Macon 44, and uh, we're just trying to take a few minutes to answer as many questions as we can on the hashtag, and we'll just dive right back in uh, on this. Uh, at Fig Druten, that's a clever name, uh, asks, how come women are faring so bad in the current economy? That's, a, that's a, an excellent question, and I can say a couple of things about it. The recession that uh, we experienced in this country, the, the very worst recession that probably uh, almost everyone who's watching this has experienced in his or her lifetime because it was the worst recession since the Great Depression in the 1930s, um, caused in its early years uh, dramatic job loss uh, for men in particular. Uh, industries like construction and, 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 and others that were heavily, uh, that were dominated by, by men uh, suffered the most significant job loss. Uh, that's evened out, and, and women have, uh, at, at the other end of the recession, at the, uh, as we were coming out of it, um, saw uh, significant job loss. So uh, on balance, I think uh, both men and women have suffered through this recession significantly. On the broader question of women in the economy and women in the labor force, uh, this president is absolutely committed to ensuring not just that women and all Americans are able to find work as we emerge from this recession, uh, but that women who do uh, find work are paid uh, at a fair rate. And, and that is why the very first piece of legislation that this president signed into law was the Lilly Ledbetter uh, Fair Pay Act the, uh, that, that uh, codifies into law uh, that uh, women should be paid uh, equally for equal work. Uh, that's a commitment this president has uh, made from the beginning of his time in office and he'll, he'll carry it forward as long as he is in office. Right. Okay. Um, Inda Lynch um, has a question about the European debt crisis um, and basically asks, has the White House considered financial intervention to stabilize the euro? Our approach to the eurozone crisis has been to uh, consult with our European counterparts, the President with his counterparts, Secretary of the Treasury Geithner with his counterparts, uh, and to offer our counsel and advice. It is our belief that uh, uh, our conviction that the Europeans have it within their own capacity to deal with this and also it is in their interest to deal with the Eurozone crisis. Uh, and uh, this is an ongoing uh, dialogue that we've had with our European counterparts for, for, for a long time now uh, at the G20 in Cannes, France. Uh, the President uh, had many discussions about this with uh, European allies. Uh, he will continue those conversations at the G8 which the United States is hosting in at Camp David uh, on Friday and Saturday. Uh, and what I can say is that uh, we believe that this is a European problem that the Europeans uh, uh, need to solve. Uh, we will advise uh, them and consult with them and offer uh, the uh, wisdom from experience that we gained from dealing with our own uh, financial crisis and, and economic crisis. Uh, but they have, the Europeans have the capacity to do it uh, and, uh, and we expect that they will. Okay, um, so I'll, there's starting to pick up here on the, again, uh, pound 1Q. People are asking all sorts of questions. And I'm sure, as you know, a lot of people are critical. A lot of people are supporting. Some people are sort of getting involved in this, uh, I think, just at the beginning. Um, but there's a question, I think, that, that does come from someone who's a little bit more critical that gets, I think, a larger theme here that uh, you might be able to address. It's uh, at RG uh, underscore here, at RG underscore here who asks, why is Obama not talking about his record and instead trying to drive people apart? And there's an awful lot of division mm -hmm. sort of in the conversation here. Can you talk a little bit about um, you know, your reaction to that overall criticism? Well, I would say a couple of things. The president frequently talks about his record. I, I'm, I travel with him everywhere he goes, and, and he uh, speaks very plainly about 
the measures that his administration took in uh, the midst of the worst economic freefall since the 1930s, a situation where we now know the economy was shrinking by 9% in the fourth quarter of 2008, the last quarter of the last presidency, uh, and uh, a situation where in January of 2009, the economy was hemorrhaging jobs at a rate of 800,000 per month. The policies the president put into place, uh, unfortunately without Republican support by and large, uh, have resulted in a situation where that free fall has been reversed, halted and reversed. The economy has been growing steadily for 11 straight quarters. We have had private sector growth now, job growth rather, private sector job growth for 26 straight months, more than 4 million jobs, more than a million jobs in the last six months alone. Unfortunately, because the hole was so deep that was dug by this recession, uh, we still have uh, a significant distance to go. There are, are still too many people who are looking for work who haven't found it. There are still too many homeowners who um, uh, have uh, homes that are underwater, their mortgages are underwater, uh, and uh, the president is constantly discussing with Congress, as he will today at a lunch that's happening as I speak with congressional leadership, both Republicans and Democrats, just uh, about uh, 25 feet from here, uh, the need for all of us to work together in a bipartisan way to take action on the economy uh, that will help it grow and help it create jobs. The President put out a congressional to-do list last week that uh, includes five items that Congress uh, should be able to act on in a bipartisan way. They're the kinds of things that Republicans and Democrats have both supported in the past, including um, giving tax incentives to small businesses to hire more people, uh, assisting veterans returning from Afghanistan and those who have returned from Iraq to find work, uh, helping homeowners uh, to take advantage of these historically low uh, interest rates to refinance their homes, um, and, and other measures. These are things that uh, would be uh, very beneficial to the economy, very beneficial to the middle class, uh, and they're the kinds of things that are not ideological, are not uh, things that uh, should divide Democrats and Republicans. They're things that we could come together and act on right away. Okay. Um, well, here's, a, here's more of a fun one uh, that you probably wish you got asked more, but uh, you just give you a chance maybe to talk about some things you don't get to talk about. Um, at Mika for Life uh, asks, who are some of the unsung heroes at the White House that Obama thinks makes the White House run but don't often get credit? And just this isn't a... T, uh, uh, lay up for, for the online folks, but you know, who are the folks that you work with that, that you think need a little bit of a credit? Besides you, Macon? <laughs> exactly, yeah. exactly. Uh, look, there, uh, there are a lot of people who are not in the public eye who uh, make every White House uh, run, and, and, and that's certainly the case here, and, and the President has a tremendous staff, and I think that um, a, a person who comes to mind because uh, as I mentioned, there's a, the President's having lunch right now with uh, Speaker of the House John Boehner, Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi, uh, and Senators uh, Reid and McConnell, um, is Rob Neighbors. He's the President's uh, uh, congressional liaison. His, his, his job is to uh, be the uh, chief interactor for the White House with uh, Congress. Uh, he's uh, got a wealth of experience. He's uh, uh, an unsung hero, to be sure and does an excellent job. They're, they're, they're just countless people who fit into that category. Uh, and everybody has the unique privilege of working here, um, puts in long hours, but uh, I know uh, I feel this way and everybody I work with feels this way, that it's uh, an absolute privilege to do so, to, uh, to work for your country, to work, uh, uh, to try to make it a better place. Yeah. Okay, um, at P. Trent Olson asks uh, a question that doesn't get mainstream attention. That's what he said. What progress has made has this administration made on refugee and humanitarian issues? Well, I mean, that's a, that's a good question. It's a broad question, uh, and, and uh, I think it, uh, the answers are more specific to, to regions where uh, there have been refugee or humanitarian crises. As you know, probably, or at least I hope you do, the President um, focused uh, very closely on the situation in Darfur uh, in Sudan, and uh, that is, uh, although now we have Sudan and South Sudan, um, uh, tensions are uh, still a real problem in that uh, part of the world, and the uh, President's team is very focused on, on that and preventing that uh, region from uh, experiencing another kind of crisis, the likes of which it, it did uh, in the not-too-distant future, uh, not-too-distant past, rather. Uh, the, uh, you know, the, the President believes that part of uh, a 
a successful foreign policy, a, a, an important element of that has to be uh, so-called soft power, the uh, ability of the United States to uh, achieve some of its national security and foreign policy goals through uh, uh, non-military means and through diplomatic means and through humanitarian means. One of the things we're doing in, uh, uh, as we contend with the terrible situation in Syria is ensuring that humanitarian assistance uh, is delivered to the Syrian people in the midst of this uh, appalling um, assault by uh, the Assad regime on its own people. Um, uh, so those are a few of the examples that I can cite, but it's certainly uh, an issue that the president takes very seriously. Okay. Um, I know we only have a few minutes left here before you have to run, but uh, at Caring GOP, um, I ask a question. Since the manufacturing sector has been the best source of U.S. middle class jobs, when can we expect a resurgence? Well, I think that's an excellent question because uh, we don't have to guess when to expect a resurgence. There has been a tremendous resurgence in manufacturing jobs in this country uh, since the recovery began. In fact, it's been one of the uh, truly bright signs in our economy uh, in the last couple of years. I don't have the statistics with me, but I think it's somewhere in the order of 400,000 or plus jobs that have been created in the manufacturing sector uh, recently. Uh, one of the uh, true uh, stellar performers you know, within manufacturing is the automobile industry. And the president, as you, you probably know, um, took uh, decisive action uh, in the midst of uh, that economic freefall during the recession uh, to uh, ensure that Chrysler and General Motors did not liquidate, did not go out of business. And that required uh, federal action. Um, there was no other alternative. And in, ex in, in return for taxpayer assistance, the president insisted on uh, that those companies uh, reform themselves in a way that would make them more competitive. And the result has been uh, really uh, incredibly uh, uh, welcome, and that is that uh, General Motors is now the number one automa automaker in the world again. Chrysler is uh, uh, succeeding uh, as is Ford. And uh, the American auto automobile industry is not only back on its feet, it's leading the world again. Uh, and. Uh, it's incredible to think about the fact that just a few short years ago, there was a real possibility that the, uh, if not the entire industry, that a lion's share of it would be lost and that we would, in the United States, no longer be a major manufacturer of automobiles. Um, thanks to the president's decisive action, uh, that's not the case. And American automobiles are back on top. Uh, they're quality products. And uh, because that industry has been revived, they're adding jobs, uh, especially in, in, uh, in the heartland, in the Midwest, where, uh, which is uh, the center of our automobile industry, which is a very good thing indeed. Great. Okay. Well, that's uh, all the time we have for today. I know you've got you've to run, so I really appreciate you making the time. Uh, and uh, hopefully this is something we'll be able to do again. And we learned a lot about kind of how this works. Uh, and uh, appreciate everyone joining on the Pound1Q hashtag. Uh, and again, you can follow Jay. This isn't just to get followers, but I'm sure you wouldn't mind. Um, <laughs> at PressSec. Uh, and uh, you're heading to the briefing uh, in a little Yeah, bit. I'm going to go and do the uh, old-fashioned form of uh, Q&A in the uh, White House briefing room in uh, probably about 45 minutes, half an hour. So you can check that out, the same uh, website you're at right now, whitehouse.gov live. Thanks again, everyone, for joining, uh, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Thank you.